So let's spend a little bit of time talking about mantra practice or a repetitious meditation practice that involves a phrase, a word, or a saying. Uh, one, let's see what is the benefit of it, and two, we're going to see how we can actually do it and incorporate it into our lives. So what does a mantra mean? A mantra can mean some kind of sacred phrase given to you by a teacher, and that phrase could have some kind of meaning. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. A mantra can be a repetitious phrase that's actually chosen by you. Uh, when we do these phrases, uh, how do we do them and what's the importance of them? How do we integrate them becomes a better question. We're not going to spend so much time talking about the religiosity, the validity, or do certain mantras mean certain things or have certain power. That's really not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about mostly about the psychology. What does it do with our mind and practically how we can use it in our lives. So a mantra practice can be very useful because you can use it in everyday life. It's very, very user friendly. Um, a common mantra that people have heard of, for example, like in transcendental meditation is OM. People will chant OM or you can go to a yoga studio and they might chant OM. That's something that people might have heard. And sometimes when there's a religious connotation with mantras, it can make other people who don't have that religious feeling feel intimidated or feel funny about it. So what I tell patients or when I talk to students and we talk about mantra practice, first I ask them, one, uh, do you have a phrase that you might like or what tradition do you come from? For example, let's say you're a Christian and you like a tradition, uh, like you're a Christian and you want to use something from the Bible. I say, great. So what I tell them to do is go find a phrase that they like and make it short. In the beginning, shorter is better. I actually like four syllables, but somewhere short and I'll tell you why later. Uh, if they don't have something specific, maybe they just want to uh, choose something that's a, a little bit uh, generic, but at the same time can be very important to them. For example, like God is love or all is love or all is well. Okay. If they don't have a particular phrase that grabs them, it is useful if it's a phrase that has some kind of meaning that means something to them. Uh, if they don't, then uh, they can ask a teacher. They might ask me, uh, what phrase should I use or would you like to give me a mantra? I'll just ask them, would you like me to give you a mantra? So if they say yes, then I might start off with Guan uh, Sen Bo Sai. This is a mantra that I used for about seven years when I practiced and Guan Sen Bo Sai is the Bodhisattva of Compassion in Buddhism. Uh, you don't have to think of it in a religious sense. You can if that's your inclination, but you can think of it as the compassionate aspect of your own nature and what you're doing is you're cultivating that for yourself and you're also cultivating that for others. So the pronunciation of that is Guan Seum Bo Sai. If you were to spell it, it would be G W A N. S-E-U-M-B-O-S-A-L and the pronunciation is Guan Seum Bo Sal. Once again, you could use uh, honestly something like uh, all is love or all is well. Uh, my monk friend, he used to talk about it and said you could use anything. You could use Coca-Cola. It doesn't matter. Uh, it does seem to have more emotional and psychological impact when it has some resonance with you. So how does one use it? Let's talk about the practicalities of it. This is, a, I think, much more interesting. I'm very interested in trying to help patients and students put things into practice that can help them go through a transformative process. So when you're meditating, when you're in formal meditation, you can actually use that as your background. Instead of doing something like a labeling, like rising and falling, you can just hook it with your breath. Okay, right now we're just going to use Guan Sen Bo Sa for um, uh, simplicity's sake, we're just going to choose one. So what would happen is, is for example, as you breathe in, you would be in your mind lightly holding and chanting Guan Sen Bo Sai. As you breathe out, it would be Guan Sen Bo Sai. As you do that and your mind starts to become a little bit more stable, what you could do is actually slow it down. You could breathe in Guan Sen. You could breathe out Bo Sai. As you get more stable, even slower, Guan Sam, Bo, Sai. Even more stable, Guan, Sam, Bo, Sai. We did that. But as you get even more stable, you could breathe in, breathe out, one syllable, Guan, Sam, 
보, 살. So the speed with which you do a mantra can reflect the stability of your mind. Let's say your mind was very jumbled and you were having a very difficult time, you could do it very quickly. Guan Sen Bo Sai, 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 Guan Sen Bo Sai. So as you do this process, as you're doing your mantra, you're still observing. You're observing thoughts coming up. You're just letting go and you're using your mantra as your anchor and that's what you're using as your focal point, Kwan Sin Bo Sai. So when you're in meditation, what you can do is actually take your mantra and you put it into the foreground, which means it becomes the focus of your meditation. You, the reason why mantra is very user-friendly is when you go out into your regular everyday life, oftentimes we don't have the ability to have a focus where we can actually put our meditation in our foreground. Our meditation actually becomes more part of our background and we start to practice this observing mind. So what that means with, uh, in relationship to a mantra is it can be kind of like a broken record. You have it in the background and you're just doing your normal life. If you're driving your car, it's just in the background. Guan Sen Bo Sai, Guan Sen Bo Sai, and you're driving your car. It's kind of eating up some of the static, some of the excess noise that your mind is always kind of churning on. And most of the time, well, a large degree of the excess noise in our mind, honestly, is negative. It's full of worry and self-criticism and judgment and doubt. Some of what we think about and what's in our mind, much of it is actually neutral, some of it is positive. But there is a large chunk of it, and I think that you would admit that, that's actually harmful for you if you were to observe it. So Guan Sen Bo Sa is actually eating into that, is soaking up some of that energy, kind of like a sponge. Let's say you were talking to somebody, okay? If you're talking to somebody, you can have it very lightly in your mind. Let's say that person was very, very, it made you just nervous to be there. You couldn't even sit there and your face was twitchy and you're all anxious. For some reason, it was an uncomfortable experience. You could take a second and put that more into the foreground. And as it puts into the foreground and you were to do it, what would happen is, is if you could relax and concentrate on it, it would take the energy away from the confrontation. But when you do that, of course, you're kind of dividing your attentions. So anytime you do something, you do have to watch where is your mind uh, focused and how are the attentions being split. If you're cutting, if you're cutting your vegetables, Guan Sen Bo Sai is in the background. If you bring it into your foreground, you might not be paying attention to cutting vegetables and you could actually cut your finger, okay? So this is something to watch. So when you do a mantra, a mantra, the reason why it's so user-friendly is because you can bring it out in everyday life. It can be used in almost any situation and it's so repetitive that it's very, very easy to remember. The complications with it is sometimes because it's so repetitive, what happens is we start to take it for granted. In the beginning, because it's new, uh, the mind has what we call project mind. It gets excited. It's got something new, something new to grab onto. So it'll do it and it'll be happy about it. But then what will happen is eventually it gets kind of bored with it. As it gets kind of bored with it, it says, well, I want a new mantra, I want a new thing, I want something else that makes me feel better in this situation. So what I tell patients is I always tell them to dig one well deep. Let's not dig a bunch of wells shallow, let's dig one well deep. So choose one mantra for now. Let's let, let's let ourselves really have a good anchor before we start to actually use other mantras because mantras can be used for all kinds of reasons if you have specific needs for example fear you can use a specific mantra all of these things can be done but as we're starting our process let's stick with one so you use it every day in everyday life and then what happens is is you can get kind of bored with it but when you get bored with it you're just meeting a place of resistance in your mind so when you start to do more formal practice and you're using your mantra and you bring it back into the foreground, what you're doing is you're actually feeding that practice deeper and it's kind of getting through these resistance points. There's lots of other helps that you can use. For example, these days, every mantra probably on earth is on YouTube. You could literally just play it in the background as you're sitting on your couch eating your breakfast. So you're having some support as you just hear the mantra, okay? And these are other ways to give your uh, practice some, I guess, some it changes, a little bit of uh, different dimensions, and at the same time give it some support. So uh, I did a mantra for about seven years of my life, and I practiced with it. I found it to be very, very useful. And there are a lot of other 
uh, helps that you can have when you're practicing a mantra. For example, a mala, prayer beads, or even a rosary in Catholic and Catholicism. These are all religious. Um, they don't have to be religious if you're not religious, but they're all uh, psychological helps where you have something tangible that you can hold that can actually support your practice. For example, if you had prayer beads, and I used to sit in the subway, and I would sit in the subway, there's nothing to do. I got to be on that thing for 30 minutes, and everybody's quiet. These days, everybody's just looking at their phone. So I'd just take it into my hand, and I'd just do my mantra, and I'd flip it. I'd just flip it as I did it, and you could flip it faster if you're nervous or you have too much energy. You could flip it slower as you start to have a little bit more focus, and it starts to take the foreground, okay? So let's repeat what we've learned so far. You can use any phrase that you like. If you have a teaching figure, you can have them give it to you. The mantra that I started off with was Guan Sam Bo Sa. It's the compassionate aspect of your own nature that you're cultivating for yourself and others. You can use it in the background in your everyday life. It just spins like a broken record, eating up unnecessary thoughts. You can do your everyday activities. You can write your paper. You can hang out with somebody. Uh, also, when you're in a more formal place, when you're a little bit quieter and you're able to, you can take that and put it into the foreground. And as it's in the foreground, what you can do is hook it to your breath. Quan sam bo sal, quan sam bo sal. You can slow it down. Quan sam bo sal. You can slow it down more. Quan sam bo sal. Even more. Quan sam Bo Sa. And what you'll know is you start to slow it down and start to enunciate and elongate the words is that you get more and more clarity and more and more focus with that. Okay? So those are the steps to working with that. What happens when you don't actually want to hold on to the mantra anymore? When the mantra, the words, even having the words start to get a little bit heavy? Well, you can actually let them go. So, when you start to let them go, because it is an anchor, it's there to support you. Instead of Quan Sim Bo Sal, you might just let it go and just be in breath. And then even as you're in breath, you can let go of breath. But then what happens? Well, that's very interesting. If you experience that, I'd like you to contact me and, let, and tell me. Let me know what you found. But we have to be cautious because we assume, we assume, for example, that, oh, I don't need this mantra anymore. I'm comfortable, I'm really just being. And what will happen is our mind, our ego, will start to creep back in and will start to take over our actions. And before you know it, habitual energy will really start to drive your life again. So what we're doing with the mantra practice is we're basically taking our mind and we're cultivating, reducing this habitual energy which governs our life. So let's not fool ourselves. That habitual energy is the reason why you are where you are right now, okay? And it's the reason why sometimes it's difficult to become who you want to become or actually see who you already really are. So what we do with a mantra is we start to eat into that habitual energy and then start to have it become more repetitious and it starts to feed itself. Instead of the mind going to negative thinking, it'll just go to the mantra. So. Don't just think, oh, I got this all together. I don't need it anymore. Let's be cautious about that and let's be real about that. Sometimes that's why it's very useful to have a teacher so you can speak with them so they can check the clarity of your mind. And if you start to find yourself kind of going back to sleep, because when you're doing something like a mantra, you're actually awake. You're actually aware of what you're doing as opposed to a bunch of unconscious thought. So as you're falling back asleep, you can say, oh, I need to get back to my mantra. Okay. So those are very wonderful ways that we can practice a mantra. I like it because of the user friendliness of it. And I challenge you to start working with one. Uh, good luck with that. And let's talk about how you do in the future.